Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'm sorry to say because of the results of immature Islamic scholarship. You know, these are the people that Sheikh Imran Hussein calls the schoolboys. Well, I'm about to introduce you to one of these schoolboys that exposes exposes a uh, a discussion, a private discussion amongst people, number one. An academic discussion that has not had conclusions, number two. Okay? He exposes these uh, discussions to the world about the preservation of Qur'an, about the different ihraf, about the different qira'as. He exposes it to the world in order to a such a sensitive uh, topic, okay, he exposes it to the world in order to get back to Dr. Qa uh, Yasir Qadi. And so, this is the type of hasad people have. This is the type of hasad the scholars have. And so, let me show you how he justifies. It, it's like this. Let me explain to you. Let's say there's a gr group of uh, Muslim or non-Muslim philosophers, and I'm having a dis an academic discussion with them. Okay, and I, in that discussion, I say, "Look, we cannot prove the existence of God. It's not like you can take the idea of God into a laboratory and you can test it. You cannot see God. I accept that. Uh, you cannot. Uh, uh, there are uh, there are. If you only go with logic." then there are reasons to say, okay, you can doubt the existence of God, okay? You can take this statement of mine that is not a conclusion, but an ongoing discussion that I'm having in emails, and then this uh, can be now, this conversation is hijacked by somebody, and then it goes to somebody who doesn't like me and exposes it and says, see, Sheikh Omar Baloch doesn't really believe in God, he's just been putting this uh, this masquerade on, which is basically what he'll say, that because he is quote-unquote Ikhwani, therefore it's so bad that he's part of the Ikhwan, oh my God, it is so bad that he has, and, and that's not uh, the characterization of Dr. Yasakadi of himself. This is him trying to impose a certain... A uh, view that he has of Ikhwan, okay, a certain negative view he has of Ikhwan, which is so bad that, you know, I have to expose this, okay? And so, this is the type of schoolboy scholarship, immature scholarship, the type of scholarship about which the Prophet said, Sharrun nasi tahtu sama, the worst of the people under the sky. Ulama'uhum, are there scholars, fitnatu yakhruju ilayhim wa ya'udu ilayhim. The fitnas will come out from them and will come back to them. Because this is the most irresponsible, most irresponsible type of thing that this person does. And now this whole controversy about the preservation of Qur'an has started because of the, 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 and maybe it's good in the sense that we can have this discussion, okay? So, this is how this scholar, known the Da'wa man, how he justifies his uh, putting out private emails into public. And this is how he justifies that an ongoing discussion, which has not reached a conclusion, that how he thinks that still should be exposed. Alright, well, I want to move on to more, more specifics about the video. Because, because for me, for me, the um, the fact that it was a private email, right? To me, that is like I don't, I don't understand um, how that can be justified. You know, I, I think that was that was what was very, very negative about the whole thing. Is that there's you, you are. I mean, you you have a re reputation. I mean, a, re a reputation for um, really, I guess, Dawa towards the youth, all the Mubarak, you, you look younger than you even are, you know, so you come out, you have this private email, you look young, energetic, you, you, it's the year of reputation, and it's like, you know, so, so all of that's coming together, and then you have, on top of all of that, like I said, you have this, this private email that you're coming out with, and it's like, where did you get this email, is this email even real, like, how, 
I mean, how did this happen? You know, I feel like that was something. To me, I don't feel like that was right. So how did, how did um, you know, how do you justify putting out a private email like that? I really appreciate that question. So, you know, say that I'm to Ireland is the government college for the merchants to very powerful colleague. Um, so so it is if there's a conflict between two goods, then you will take the good of the two goods. And if there's a conflict between two evils, you can take the less of the two evils. So we are presented with a situation uh, in which there was no good. There was only two evils. One evil was that we were going to put out. By the way, there was no situation. There was no situation. It was a private email. It had not become a situation. You made it into a situation. You made it into a situation. There was no... It's a private email. What situation? There is no situation in this. You made it into a situation, bro. I mean, subhanAllah. He's making something into a private conversation between a group of people into a situation. How is that a situation? It's none of your business. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever opens a letter that does not belong to him and reads it, it's as if he's looking into the face of the hellfire. It wasn't even a situation. That's a lie. Because it was a private email. But he makes that Oh my, my God, I got this private situation. I have found out what Dr. Uh, Yasser uh, Qadi really believes. I have discovered this. I need to expose him now to the world because he is so bad. He is like not a Muslim. Private emails, which is, which is, which is, which is a shock. Private emails, which is a shock, which is, a shock, which is an evil. But see, you see, when you do this, oh well, this is the greater evil, this is the lesser evil. There's this open, this type of thinking is good when you are actually in a position of being a judge and you actually have a position of judiciary where there are cases in front of you and you actually have to choose in the real world. Okay, but if you bring this into the hypothetical world and if you're not in a position of authority and you start making a comments like this that this is the greater evil and this is the lesser evil then you are going heading for chaos because your priorities are not the same as somebody else's priorities okay and your priorities of the lesser and the greater evil because they're both evil right so there's going to be a difference of opinion which one is the greater one which one is the lesser one for example i say it would have been much better if you would have just kept this private, okay? And you just would have, you could have talked based upon what was actually being said or has been actually been written. And then if you want to discuss that and debate that, you have the right to that because that's public property. But I think that what he did, of course, was the greater evil. There's no question about it. The results of that have shown that. It's bad. It's, it's not something good to put out something private into the public. That is a shock. I'll be the first to tell you that. This is the real life discussion we had amongst our team, amongst our team, even our audience, when we had this conversation. So the first shock that we had was that we're going to put out a conversation that's taking place in private. But we also had another shock. Which is that if we don't address this issue right now, this man is going to bring it out you see, you to understand the context, you really have to understand who you are. This is the idea of su'u zan. Having, instead of husnu zan, a good opinion about Muslims. Okay? I disagree with, and people that know, have seen my lectures, know I disagree with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf on certain issues of, of, of his political views. Okay? I disagree with, like, uh, even Dr. Yasir Qadi in terms of how he described Ya'juj and Ma'juj. I disagree. But that... But there's a certain adab, there's a certain respect, there's a certain scholarship. You have to respond to these things as scholar because it's about knowledge, it's about truth. You don't make it personal. This person is making it personal. And, 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 and you know, the thing is, is that, uh, 
now he's going to try to make Dr. Yasir Qadi with his su'azan, with his evil thoughts about another Muslim brother, which then he is down look, looking down upon another brother, okay? Instead of saying there's an ilmi ikhtilaf, there's a, there, there's ikhtilaf al-ilm, yeah, there's ikhtilaf, there's a different opinion as far as knowledge is concerned, but a Muslim brother is a Muslim brother. Now he's going to try to label him Labels that he himself probably doesn't even understand what it means to be those labels that he's trying to give. Yasir Qadi is. Yasir Qadi, as just generally, which is something that they, which is, which is, which is, which is a characteristic of Ikhwan Muslimi, is that they don't... Which is a characteristic of Ikhwan Muslimi, like, it's a characteristic of Fir'aun. It is in the Qur'an, and he's like Fir'aun, and he's doing things like Fir'aun, and therefore I have to attack him. You see, this is the childish behavior where because you disagree with someone in knowledge, you're going to try to expose them given the chance. So, oh, Dr. Qazi, Yasir Qazi is not going to expose his beliefs right away, but because he is so evil and he will eventually expose his his belief eventually he will expose it so therefore i'm going to attack him now but do you have qat'i knowledge of this do you have definite knowledge of this you're talking like you know the ghaib you have the unseen you know what's in his heart when you go to a person of innovation he will not tell you what his big eyes immediately he'll tell you quran sunnah quran sunnah until he knows he's got you and then he'll throw his shiva into your heart and when it enters your heart when will it come out so we see that yasir qabi He's a person who has had beliefs some for over a decade. And he's hidden them from the masses. And there are certain people you know, I know, the people know, whose names I won't mention just now, right now, because I, I don't know if they want to in this perspective, but I've seen them talk about it publicly, so I don't really think they have an issue, but I will shut for them, I won't mention it right now. But they, they sat with Yasser Qadi almost a decade ago, and they were like, they had already told us these beliefs Yasser Qadi had. Like some, some of the beliefs Yasser Qadi had like are crazy. Some, some, some of the beliefs I still know, and I haven't, I haven't come out with it just yet. You know what I'm saying? I haven't come out with what some of the filth and corruption he believes. But why is it that he hasn't come out with it just yet? Because he knows the people would exactly the problem he had said. If he told you. Now compare this with Sheikh Yasser Qadi's own words about himself and what he believes. Compared to what this person is assuming and what others he thinks, uh, what others have told him with their son, with their evil thinking about other people, right? So this is the problem with the Islamic scholarship today. So how are we going to, you know, so, so now you have a Quranic controversy as a result. Now. Types of cutting edge munaqasha between people and thoughts. You know, as it happens, okay? And yeah, one, one of the, the main conditions was everything is in Ghana because, because we are not, this is not, not any, we're, we're having the internal, you know, when you discuss, discuss with a peer or with a colleague, you're going to be back and forth discussing and whatnot. It's, it's not a publishable material. material. Uh, and, and so, so this issue, issue came up, up. we had a lot of discussions about Akhida and Najdi Da'wa, and I presented my views there, we have another discussion. And the issue of, you know, Qira'at and Quran and Ahmadu came up. And, you know, Alhamdulillah, that we had a very interesting discussion where all different views were given back and forth. There's at least 160, 70 emails between maybe 30 brothers back and forth. And, you know. Now, notice Dr. Yasir Qadi is having this discussion with 30 brothers. It's an academic discussion, has not reached a conclusion, as you will see. There were people that were on the right of me, there were people on the left of me. But again, Allah has sent to me because I'm Yasir Qadi. All those are the emails we ignored, and it's, you know, my bits and pieces. So one of the brothers, um, yeah, and he did something again unethical. Uh, it was expelled from the list, and the list was basically banned because of that. Stopped because of that. He couldn't refuse to argue, and so he sent it to a one of the in uh, in uh, England. And so then, of course, this is what gave it to the other one, and so obviously, and everything, in, uh, you know, all whatever broke loose. But again, this was not something I brought to the public, and I would never bring it up in public. And I don't think it's wise to bring it up. We were having an amana based on one, one thing. I think, I think the first thing brought it up was, was not a mental thing to say, just, just to be clear. Like, it was, yeah, he's yeah, more on the right in terms of, but not for all intents and purposes, not like a card carrying. Uh, 
wala si man kaya may hindi yung bata kasi parang I mean that you I view I view this person as the same strand of hunting for six pulses and he should do something better with his life anyway I don't know I don't know the brother and if this is really bothering me but um my point is that what happened was unethical were you having dialogue discussion by the way even in their series of emails I said you know I'm still developing my ideas we're having a discussion to go back and forth that's what you do when you're having a conversation with me Now, for this brother to then spread it and make it, that was something that he has to answer on the day of judgment, and if it was done out of ill intention, I shall not forgive anything done out of ill intention against me, unless they apologize to me. Uh, my my, uh, my suing is going to be in the court of Allah, and this is, by the way, like to say, everybody who is refuting other people, I speak for myself. If, you're, if you have in your heart to live and has said that it, and you don't apologize to me, in that case, my... Is that in front of the law? So you're now get your hands on to do what you want. Anybody who's sincere, shout in the law. You are forgiven, and anybody who comes to me, anybody who comes to me, is automatically forgiven because that shows that that is wrong. Anyway, my point being that this brother did something wrong. He's going to be asked about because that is not something that should have been done to leak a private email amongst fellow students of college. Okay, so that is why I never got involved in deep into anything because it was unethical in the first place. Reach up, reach up, come on. Now, as for the issue itself, every single student of knowledge knows who studies Rulu Quran that the most difficult topics are Ahruf and Kiraat, and the concept of Ahruf, the reality of Ahruf, and the relationship of that. Ahruf and Kiraat have to do with the different uh, ways, like Maliki Yawmiddin, Maliki Yawmiddin. Okay? We all know this, we've all heard Maliki Yawmiddin, versus Maliki Yawmiddin. So I'm going to keep it simple and then explain this to you. But I want to also clarify that why this whole situation occurred is uh, is what I'm explaining first. And then I will, inshallah, uh, spend some time explaining to you uh, something very unique and very clear that will ex that I think is, is the end of this debate. And I will clarify some misconceptions Muslims have on this issue and then I believe next week inshallah next with this coming week on Thursday or Friday or one of the days that I can uh, there's a brother who's done a PhD based upon the studies of Mona Farahi. Mona Farahi has a very unique understanding of the preservation of Quran based upon his hermeneutics based upon his methodology of understanding this which is very different from uh which which sets the whole stage very clear very clear after that and then we'll then of course the what's more important than looking at the original manuscripts so i'm going to talk about the original manuscripts that i've looked at and i'll make this uh, this this whole thing a lot more clear inshallah okay and the preservation of the Ahruf is one, is a three, is a seven, and the relationship of the Qira'ah to the Ahruf. This is a topic that, when you're at the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize what your teacher is saying and regurgitate it out, and you don't fully comprehend. When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. And this isn't you. This is from the time of the Sahaba. In the Sahih and the Hassan Hadith, the Hadith of the Ahruf, that when the Prophet is mentioning the issue of Ahruf, and then there are different Ahruf and whatnot, this is in the version of Muslim Ahmad, who way with Kaab says, authentic Hadith, فَدَخَلَ فِي نَفْسِي شَكْ In my heart, a doubt came that I hadn't had about the Islam since the days of Jahil. This is not a joke, brothers and sisters. The issue of Ahruf and Kiraat caused confusion. To somebody, somebody whom the Prophet said, if you want to listen, listen to the Quran directly, listen to Ubay. Ubay is not some even average Sahabi. Now, that doubt doesn't need to exist today because we have the original manuscripts almost from the Makki period of the Prophet, meaning in Makkah. And I'll show you the manuscript. From the time of Makkah to today, and you can compare them. And that's the ultimate thing. I mean, we can talk theoretically, how is the Quran compiled? And I'll talk a little bit about that. But the ultimate thing is practically, okay, what is the result? And if you look at the original manuscripts of the of the Makki Quran, okay, which Birmingham University 
discovered not recently and I actually have a khutbah on Birmingham Quran which when this first came out I uh, looked into it I got I downloaded the manuscripts and so on and so forth and so we'll be looking at one of those manuscripts together so that it's absolutely clear for everyone and then I'll go into more details as time goes by inshallah okay is the Qari of the Quran. He is the master. He is who he is. And he was for Dakhar to give us his shakr. What is all this? And the Prophet, the prophet, prophet put, it, yeah. put his hand and then he goes, ha, it all went away. Ya khi, me and you, we don't have that blessing, do we? Me and you don't have that blessing. Now, again, this is a few minutes. You ask this very honest question. It's the first time I'm saying these things. Many people are aware who listen to my lectures that I mentioned the crises that happened to me at Yale. My first year at Yale. It wasn't a crisis of faith, by the way. very clear about this. People misinterpreted. It was a crisis of my understanding of the knowledge. It was a crisis of what my teacher taught me. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, as somebody who remembers the Quran as a teenager, alhamdulillah, in my entire life, I have never doubted that the Quran is divine. You cannot doubt that. I mean, you listen to it, you recite it, you just cannot doubt that. It's never been an issue. Now, for the first Now, so this is, I just want to leave it up to here. Okay, so he, the, the discussion that he's having is in terms of the knowledge. So this brother that exposed this email and caused this controversy uh, should apologize publicly uh, to Dr. Yasser uh, Qadi. Okay, now having done that, now let us look at the subject at hand, inshallah. So let me start by mentioning this is a book on Qiraat al Ashra. Okay, now all the different variant readings, this is what this whole book is about. Okay, so and, and I have each, I have a copy of each of the different uh, variants of reading Quran. Okay, so just, just to, you know, give you an example, for example, uh, this is, uh, an, uh, this is one of the riwayas. Okay, and, 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 and th this is one, I have every one of them. Okay, this is Hamish. Okay. So, uh, and we have a mushaf of each of these qira'as, okay? We have a mushaf based upon each of these qira'as. Now, I'm going to explain to you uh, my understanding and the proof of my understanding of the preservation of Qur'an, okay? So, these are all different, uh, you can say, different uh, qira'as, okay? This is an khalf an hamza, this is hamza. Okay, Hamza is very uh, interesting uh, recitation of the Quran. Let me share with you something that will uh, a little bit. Uh, if you can see this, okay, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمَ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ نَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ right غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الظَّالِمِ Okay, so this is pretty clear. Okay, uh, if you compare this with some of the other qiraas, you will see. Very. Let me just show you. Uh, um, okay, then let me show you very quickly, inshallah, if you give me a little bit of time here, this will become clear to you. Uh, okay, so if you look at this, for example, one of the other qira's, this is uh, qira ibn Kathir. Okay, this is the qira of ibn Kathir. You say, Sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim ghayrin maghtubi alayhimu. Alayhimu, okay, and Sirat al Ladina Anamta Alayhimu, okay, Sirat al Ladina Anamta Alayhim, instead of Sirat al Ladina Anamta Alayhim, Sirat al Ladina Alayhimu, Ghayrin Magdubi Alayhimu, Waladalin. You see this? Okay, so this is the type of things, or Maliki Yomiddin versus Maliki Yomiddin, okay, so those are the types of things we're talking about. So, I mean, of course. Uh, for some people, this would be, this is the Qira of Ibn Umar, okay? And uh, then let me just continue uh, with some of the other Qira's, because, uh, you know, this is the Qira of, uh, of Qalun, okay? And Hamza and the others, okay? Maliki Yawmiddin versus Maliki Yawmiddin. Uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, this is Warsh, one of the famous ones, okay? Now, what is it that I want to say? I'm going to tell you from the very beginning. The most famous of these, all of these qiraas, okay? Because I want to give you the answer in a way that you can understand. One of the most famous of all of these recitations, 
okay, is Riwaya Hafs bin Asim. Okay, Riwaya Hafs bin Asim has been called Riwaya Hafs bin Asim, but actually it is Qira'atul Amma. It is the general recitation. It is the Quran that was written by Uthman. When you look at in Bukhari, in Muslim, in Abu Dawud, in Tirmizi, in any of the books of Hadith, when Quran is written, or any ayah of Quran is written in general, right? Any ayah of Quran, unless it's talking about the different Qiraas, if you look at any of the Sahasitta, or or even Mawatta Biba Malik, or any of the uh, the writings regarding Quran, you will find that they are written in the Qira or in the recitation of Hafs bin Asim, which is the main Quran that we all are familiar with. Majority of us all read that. Okay. What happened was the Prophet ﷺ had a general recitation, which Quran mentions, by the way. And the putting down of Quran is mentioned in Quran when in the very the first thing, the very first thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ikra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who created. And then what does Allah say? Allama bil qalam. And he taught by the pen. And in the next revelation, noon. And noon means the ink pot. Okay? Noon wal qalami wa ma yasturoon. Allah says noon and by the pens what they are recording. Who is, what pens are recording? By the recording of this Quran. This is the second revelation. So Allah says, I taught by the pen. Allama bil qalam, allama al Quran. Ar Rahman wa allama al Quran. So the teaching of Quran had to be in the writing. It had to be part of it. There was qira'ah as part of it. But writing it was part of it from the very, very beginning. And this is why the Birmingham manuscripts are very important. When we studied, for example, many of the stories of the Sahaba, including Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anh, how did he become Muslim? They had a mushaf. They had a manuscript that he can read from. So the writing of Qur'an was done from the very beginning. But because there were Arabs, who were of different dialects, who were of different, uh, you know, like if you have Scottish English versus British English versus American English, so they are going to say some words differently, uh, ver ver the Scottish English. And if you only, if you like, let's say if Quran was coming down only in American English, imagine a prophet would have said, oh, prophet of Allah, can you make it easier for the dialect of the British? And can you make it easier for the dialect of the Scottish? Okay. And so Allah allows that, and so these Scottish, uh, you know, Muslims now, and these British Muslims now can read Qur the Quran, okay, that would be coming today, for example, let's say in English language, it would be coming to them in a way that they can read it because it has to be read in a certain way, in a certain, uh, certain musical, with certain tone, and so that was allowed for them. And some of that, and rather all of that, has survived. All of that has survived. But the writing of Quran, Inna alayna jama'ahu wa Quran. I'll show you this verse. It is on us to collect it in a written form and have it recited. This Allah says this in Quran. Sutulikman. Inna alayna jama'ahu wa Quran. Fa idha qara'nahu fa tabi' Quran. When we have collected it in a written form, the Jama'a, who is Jami'ul Qur'an, Uthman radiallahu anh is known generally in history as Jami'ul Qur'an. Right? لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به إن علينا جمعه When we have collected this Qur'an in a written form, that written form that started from the time of Uthman, that started from the early times of Islam, there was always one form of Qur'an from the early times of Islam, which then later became known as the Qira'ah of Hafs ibn Asim, the Qira'ah of Hafs, okay? <coughs> the others are there. But this is the main one that's all over the Muslim world, has always been all over the Muslim world, has been always the way Quran is first memorized, has all, except some portions, like uh, uh, Morocco, but even there, like Warsh, for example, Warsh is one of those Qiraz. I'll explain to you, Warsh is not different from Hafs, except in how vowels are pronounced. 
Okay, it's very important because if you take wash and Hafs bin Asim as one, and they are basically one, if you take them as one, the others are just being handed down. Okay, there's mutawatir bin naql. There is mutawatir in terms of being written down, written down, written down, copied down, copied down, copied down. Those exist, but the one qira'atul amma was always one. Recitation of Quran that was the general recitation was always one. Let's imagine again that there is a prophet in America and the prophet allows the people in Scotland and allows the people in Britain to read according to their, uh, you know, way of saying things. And let's say you have, and those of you who know, for example, also the African American community speaks English. But their English is a very, uh, you know, it, 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 it is a different uh, different way of speaking English, right? Uh, and, and there is the slang, right? Hey, yo, come here, dude, what you doing? That's really cool, right? So that, all of that, uh, so the Quran allowed the Arabs to speak in their dialects, but the Quran that was being written down by the Prophet, the Quran, and the Prophet had up to 50 scribes that it was being written down into. I'm giving you the crux of the matter. When you look at Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmizi, Ibn Majah, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, when you look at the early scholars, when they were ever referring to Quran, when you look at the earliest manuscripts, it's all Hafs bin Asim. Because that was like the main one. The others were given their, 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 their flexibility. They can read according to their uh, lingo. And that was set for them, that you can read this in this way. Okay, so um, so this has to be understood. Okay, so now let me uh, show you the manuscript, inshallah. Now, when you look at, for example, Sutu Taha, now we have from early Makkin period, this is pre Uthman, before Uthman radiallahu anh collected the Quran, we have many, many masahifs. I'll show you. But let's just go over this so that you can clearly see this and know this for yourself once and for all. The Quran is, this is the earliest copy. Okay, the earliest, this is before even the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. This is an early Makkah in which the time, this is carbon dated to even times like some Christians are trying to now say and some Orientalists are saying, oh, Quran was written before the Prophet. I don't know if you know this because this is as early as it gets. Okay, uh, so I'm going to start from this uh, portion. Uh, if I touch my cursor on it, uh, okay, in nani, can you see this? In nani and Allah. Now it doesn't have the dots, it doesn't have the tashkil, it's written in block letters, as they call it. Innani ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana. Okay. Innani ana Allah la ilaha illa ana. Then it's uh, missing because it's it's smudged out, right? La ilaha illa ana. Fa'budni. Then you can see again. Wa aqimu salata li dhikri. Okay. Inna, you see this? This is now the alif, nun alif. Inna, and then it's smudged out. Inna sa'ata atiya. Right? La ati akadu ukhfiha. You can see akadu ukhfiha li tujaza kullu nafsim bima tas'a. Then you can also see. Fala yusaddanna ka anha man la yu'minu biha. وَاتَّبَعْ هَوَاهُ فَتَرْدَى Some of that smudged out. وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا مُوسَى Okay. وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا مُوسَى Then you see here, قَاف قَالَ And then it's smudged out here, أَصَايَ Okay. أَتَوَكَّوْ عَلَيْهَا Right. And so it continues like this. Okay. Uh, now, uh, even you can see from here, uh, the rest of the, you can see the rest, you can read it. Anybody who knows Arabic and looks at this can read what it is saying. It can read it very, very clearly, okay? Over here, 
قال again you can see ألقيها يا موسى right and then what does it say فألقاها okay فألقاها فإذا هي حيئة تسعى then what Again, the dots are not there, but if you look at it, even without the قُلْ خُذْهَا وَلَا تَخَفْ لَا تَخَفْ You can see this clearly. وَلَا تَخَفْ سَنَعِيدُهَا سِيرَتَهَا الْأُولَى Okay, you see that? Then, after that, وَمْدُدْ يَدَكَ إِلَى جَنَاهِكَ تخرج بيضاء غير سوء آية أخرى. So it's there. Very, very clear. I've been through three juz of these manuscripts in my life. Okay, I think I did. I uh, went through the Birmingham manuscripts, uh, the Sut al Taha, Sut al Maryam, and Sut al Kahf. Those are uh, preserved, even, and this is pre Makkah. Okay, they're preserved from the very, uh, from the very early times. Now, when you are looking at the Qiraatul Amma, okay, what happens is that uh, some of the vowels are pronounced differently. So I'll give you an example. Okay, this is the normal Qira'a, okay. And also the Warsh version is the same as Hafs, except what the vowels are pronounced differently. Inna ila rabbika ruj'i Do you see? It's the same, the vowels are the same. Now, sometimes the pronouns and certain words are said differently in some of the other qira'as, but those are ihraf. They were allowed for like the Scottish people or the English people to be read or the 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 black people in America for them to read it according to what was easy for them but the main let's say American English was always the same and if you look at any of the early manuscripts now let me show you what I mean by that okay if you want to study the different manuscripts and my point of the different manuscripts are that there was a general recitation, which I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. If you come to Islamic Awareness, this website, mashallah, may Allah bless the person who made this website, a billion, 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 and all the brothers and the sisters and all the people that, that were in this website, that, that did work for this website, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them a billion, 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 billion times, inshallah, okay? This Quranic menu, if you go to where it says Quran and you go to where it, says, where it says Quranic manuscripts, click on that and you can get all the different Quranic manuscripts. Okay. And if you look at, so, so this would take you like almost a month going through just all the different early manuscripts. Okay. It would just take you like a whole month just going through whatever that's already here. Okay. And uh, also, if you look at the Islamic coins, all of the, like for example, there are coins with the ikhlas on it. According to which qira'a? According to the qira'atul amma. Qira'atul amma is which qira'a? Qira'atul amma is the recitation that's the general recitation is the recitation, like, you know, one of the coins, for example, there's the ikhlas on it. They have other parts of Quran in it. Uh, they are always according to. In all of the traditional literature, you'll see the main writing of Qur'an, unless it's being discussed, that such and such Sahabi also read this this way, such and such Sahabi read this in this way. And so, so, so for example, this Qira'atul Ashra, right, is about the different ways the different companions read the different verses. But, 
the main one that was according to the Quraysh dialect, okay, according to the Quraysh, like let's say American English, for example, according to the Quraysh dialect was one. And then you can go down on this website and look at all of the different manuscripts that exist. It would literally take you about two months to look at all of the manuscripts and compare them, okay. And by the time I had looked at the Birmingham manuscripts, okay, and by the time I had looked at that, and you know, uh, I'll share with you uh, this uh, point, inshallah, and, and that is that when I, uh, when I, because when it first came out, they actually had this in public, now they've hidden some of it, and uh, only a few pages now they have it in public, you can pay and get a copy ordered, uh, I, and, and I'm thinking maybe, uh, I'll I'll do that just for the sake of having at least one of these originals. But anyway, um, when I was when I had the copies and I had the Quran and I was going through like Surah Taha, for example, and I'm going through I'm looking at everything, and and sometimes my heart would beat because I'd be like, okay, what if there's a discrepancy? What if what if there's a discrepancy? Right? What if it's different? And I would go, okay, Taha Taha. And and then I would continue and I would continue and then I look at Sutul Kahf and then I look at parts of Sutul Maryam and as I'm going sometimes like for example Taha and after saying Taha right the the full stop is sometimes not very clear so it looks like it's not there or it's not very clear right but Taha ma anzalna alaykum Quran I'm looking at it I'm looking at it and I'm like thinking by the time uh, I'm like uh, you know. I, by the time I'm going through Sutul Taha, I believe, I was like, subhanAllah, this is definitely preserved. I had absolutely no doubt in my mind about the preservation of the Quran at that point. Alhamdulillah. And like I said, you can go to that website and look at the manuscripts and what people have said about this, your own self, if you're really interested in the issue. Okay. Now, let me now uh, talk about uh, another very, like how Quran sees its own preservation. Okay. So the Prophet ﷺ would be trying to memorize Qur'an as it was coming down to him very quickly. So in Surah Qiyamah, Allah is talking about the Day of Judgment and then Allah stops. Just like a teacher who's teaching a lesson and then sees the student is maybe doing something uh, that is distracting him. So then he stops the lesson and then talks to the student. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, while talking about the Day of Judgment, now says to his his student, meaning Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, O Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there is no need to uh, make haste uh, with your tongue in memorizing the Quran, because it was uh, the, it, the Allah is telling the Prophet you don't because he's worried. He you know he needs to memorize it. Allah is saying to the Prophet, don't worry about this. Because when the revelation would come to the Prophet ﷺ, what would he do? He got the revelation and then he would call in the scribes and then he would recite it to the scribes and they would write it down, okay, up to 50 scribes, okay? According to one riwayah, 30 from the Ansar, 20 from the Muhajirin would sit and take the revelation from the Prophet ﷺ and write it down. And so the Prophet would be in a little bit of a hurry. Okay, I got to get this right. I got to get this right. I got to memorize this. The Prophet says, this is not, don't worry about this. It's on us. We have sent down this dhikr. It is on us that when it's sent down to you, you will recite this. It will be gathered in, in the written form. Teach man what he did not know. And then from there you will recite. So as for now, O Prophet Muhammad you just go ahead and when we give you the revelation, when Jibreel gives you the revelation, just follow his recitation. But it is on us to gather it in the arrangement that it will be in rather than the arrangement that it came down in. So when the Quran was being written down, it was being written down in a different arrangement. But the Quran was coming down in a different arrangement. The Quran was being written down in a different arrangement. Okay, And this arrangement and this Quran that was being written down this was in accordance to the photo state. This was like the photo state copies of the Quran, that the Ummul Kitab that is with 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La yumasu illa al-mutahharun. Now, that Qur'an is according to the Qira of Hafs ibn Asim. This is now what I've explained. Now, the details of this is about a hundred hours of discussion. Okay? But this is the crux of the matter that you need to understand. That if you look at the early manuscripts, if you look at Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, and Nazi, Ibn Majah, Nisai, Muttab, Imam Malik, uh, Imam Ahmad, Musnad, if you look at any of them, the recitation of Quran is according to one. According to one recitation. Okay? Now, so over here I want to give an example of how Quran is written in the Hadith books. When it is generally written, it is written according to Hafs, which is Qiraatul Amma, the general recitation. It was known as the general recitation in the early Islamic period, but then later on uh, it just became, it, it was almost as one of the many Qiraas. No, there was the general recitation, which was the main recitation, which is the one that it was written down according to, but the Prophet had allowed others, and we'll look into that in a second, okay? So, for example, over here when it says, the verse, وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ Okay, these, all of these types of narrations are according to Qiraatul الْعَمَّةِ which is Hafs ibn Asim. Okay, so I just want to be clear about it. So I'm going to read this narration now, and then I'm going to make a few points, inshallah, and then we'll finish off for today. I heard Hisham ibn Hakim reciting Surah Al-Furqan during the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I listened to his recitation and noticed that he recited in several different ways the Prophet ﷺ, which the Prophet had not taught me. I was about to jump over him during his prayer, but I controlled my temper. When I had completed his prayer, I put up, put his upper garment around his neck and seized him by, uh, by it and said, Who taught you this surah, which I heard you reciting? He replied, The Messenger of Allah ﷺ. He said, you told a lie, for the Prophet taught it to me in a different way from yours. So I dragged him to the Prophet وسلم, and the Prophet uh, uh, and said, I heard this person reciting Surah Al-Furqan in a way which you haven't taught me. On, the, on that, the Prophet said, وسلم, release him, O Umar, recite, O Hisham. So Umar is the one who heard the surah different from the way that he was taught. Okay, and then... Uh, Umar, uh, so the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, release him, O Umar, recite, O Hisham. Then he recited in the same way as I heard him reciting. Then the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was revealed in this way. And he added, recite, O Umar. And the Umar, radiallahu anh, recited it as he had been taught. And the Prophet said, it was revealed in this way. The Quran has been revealed to be recited in seven different ways, the Prophet said. Okay. So recite it in whichever is easier for you, meaning according to the Arab uh, tongue. If you're Scottish English, uh, you know, if you speak Scottish English versus if you speak uh, British English versus if you speak uh, Black English versus if you speak uh, White American English, okay? But then what? Over here is now the important part. When it came to the part of Qur'an being written down and then being recited, which I discussed from Sutul Qiyamah, فَإِذَا قَرَأْنَاهُ فَاتَّبِعْ قُرْآنَ لَا تُحَرِّكْ بِهِ لِسَانَكَ لِتَعْجَلَ بِهِ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا جَمَعَهُ وَقُرْآنَ When we bring it together and then recite, has to do with this part of history. It was Zayd ibn Thabit. It, it is said that Zayd ibn Thabit attended the final review in which it was clarified what was abrogated and what remained. Okay? Uh, Abu Abdurrahman as sulami said, Zayd radiallahu an recited the Qur'an twice to the Prophet. Now remember in the last year, the Prophet had recited Qur'an twice to Jibra'il in the order of its revelation. And I also made the point Qur'an was being written down in the life of the Prophet from the earliest times. Even if Abu Bakr had not collected Qur'an, even if, even if Uthman had not collected the Qur'an, we would have the exact same Qur'an because it, the process had already started from the time of the Prophet. Zayd recited the Qur'an twice to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, during their year in which he passed away. And this recitation is called the Qira of Zayd. But this is actually Qira, which then became Qira of Hafs. Okay? This is the Qira that was Qira'atul Amma 
This was the Qira according to the lexic, the linguistics of the Quraysh dialect. This has to be clear. So while the Prophet allowed other versions to exist, but once the Quran was written down according to the Quraysh dialect, and this is what the Prophet said, so now this is a longer discussion, but the Prophet specifically said about the Quraysh dialect, okay? So Zayd recited the Quran twice to the Prophet during the year in which he passed away. This recitation is called the Qira of Zayd because he transcribed it for the Prophet and recited it to him to, to him and witnessed uh, Arda al-Akhira. And he taught it, taught its recitation to the people until he passed away. This is why Abu Bakr and Umar relied on him in its compilation, meaning in the, the, the book that Uthman had. And Uthman appointed him in charge of writing the Mus'haf. May Allah be pleased with them all. Okay, so now let me give you an example of this. And then I'm going to say one final thing for today. And then we'll have the spiritual exercise. And that is that let's imagine that uh, somebody is writing a song. Okay, when you're writing a song, there can be different versions. Okay, you had uh, you wrote on one piece of paper, then you wrote on another piece of paper, and another piece of paper. The same song with some different wordings, wordings. But when you went to sing it and publish it in the album, there's a certain standard. Okay, and now uh, some people may have access to those other pages when the song was not uh, uh, published. Okay. What happened in the case of the Prophet, now this example is a little bit, I'm just trying to make the point that there's one standard publication, okay? And that is the Qira of Zayd, that is the Qira, the same as Qira of Hafs. And the proof of that is if you look through the books of Hadith, you will only find Qira of Hafs, okay? And so I wish if somebody can convey this message to uh, Dr. Yasir Qadi or to the other brothers that they have to consider this it's very, very important to consider this because uh, Zayd and Qira of Hafs is basically the same. And uh, when you look at the 10 Qira, so for example, in this way, when it says, غير المغضوب عليهم right? عليهم uh, some companions of the Prophet recited it that way according to their dialects and their tribe and what was easy for them. But when it was written down according to the Quraysh dialect, which was not a competing, it wasn't the competing version of other tribes. Other tribes recited according to what was easy easy way for them to recite, but the one that was written down and then recited thereafter was the one Quran that we have today, starting from the day of the Sabbath, going to Hafs. So the Qira of Hafs is the Qira al Amma. Okay? And this is the, the Quran according to the revelation of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, so I just wanted this to be very clear. I hope I'm very clear in what I have said so far. Over here, I want to uh, make a, a few points that are very important. Uh, one is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had a whole mushaf in his house with Aisha radiallahu anha, um, and then. Uh, there was also a copy that went to Hafsa radiallahu anha. So there were complete copies of the Qur'an, even though, the, like I said, Qur'an was being written down from the beginning. And the example of that is the story of Umar. Now, inshallah, let us um, do our spiritual exercise, inshallah. So I just wanted that point to be clear. Uh, the there are many qira'as, but there is one main standard qira. Okay, so I hope we're very clear about that. That is the standard one. That is the way it was written down. That is the way it's always been jotted down in all of our traditional books. Unless there was a discussion on he recited it this way and then he recited it this way. The qira of this companion was like this. And that those qira'as have been coming down. But those are not the standard Qira's. The standard Qira is the one that Uthman radiallahu anh, had written down, the, the according to the Quraysh dialect. Okay. The, now I didn't talk about the actual process of transmission and the actual process of preservation.
but I talked about certain concepts so that when we say, oh, that recitation and that recitation, we can be very clear that they exist, but there's one that's the main one, okay? Now, uh, inshallah, let us now uh, move on to the spiritual exercise today, which is today listening to no other surah other than Surah Al-Furqan by a great reciter. So inshallah, we're going to enjoy, enjoy his recitation. Uh, Sayyid Noor, Sayyid Noor from Sudan. So that's the recitation. Uh, I'm not going to go over the translation of all of it. Maybe just a little bit, just so that we have something in our mind too. Okay? Very, very beautiful. Subhanallah. The Ibad rahman the servants of, of Rahman. Yamshuna, they walk over the earth. And when they are dressed by the ignorant ones, Qalu Salaamah. They say, we're peace. Those who spend their nights with Allah in sujood and in standing before Allah. And they pray to Allah. Oh Allah, avert the punishment of the hellfire. Because the punishment of it is very difficult, very hard. 
it is the worst place to be for even a moment or definitely permanently. And those who spend, and they're, they don't give everything away, but they spend in the middle way. They don't call anyone with Allah. And they don't kill any soul that Allah has made sacred, except with just cause. And they don't do zina. The one who does that has done a great sin. There will be double punishment on the Day of Judgment. And then he will be humiliated. Except for the one who does Tawbah. After doing his work. And then he does the right deeds. For those people that change, Allah will take their bad deeds and make it good. Then Allah just Allah turns to the one who turns to him. So we'll end here inshallah. Inshallah, okay. So alaikum. Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. I